So welcome, welcome uh, to our session, leading through practice, voice change and expression in design. So whether you're uh, watching with us now live or whether you are watching at some other time that's convenient for you, welcome. Really looking forward to hearing from our two wonderful creative practitioners um, who are with us today, both of whom work with social conscious with, that are very much a part of the priority of their work. Very different approaches, but we're very delighted to introduce to you Ella Doran, a multi-talented designer and circular e economy champion and artist, the wonderful Alistair Lambert, who runs sculpture workshops and delivers community-based projects as part of his socially conscious practice. They each are going to share with us their practice, their inspirations, and invite you to join them in some hands-on activity. How wonderful. Mm -hmm. And hopefully we'll have some time for some Q&A at the end. So do please feel, feel free to uh, pop your questions in the chat and hopefully we can have a, uh, an opportunity to um, have a, a really wonderful discussion at the end. So I'm now going to, uh, or just before I do hand over to um, Alistair, um, just a, a question for us to think about um, as, as we are watching and processing what it is that we're seeing. How can art teachers make their art rooms more sustainable? And how can they make sustainable design part of their curriculum? So that's our key, key question for, for this for this session. So uh, when you're ready, Alistair, over to you. You just need to unmute, Alistair. Sorry, hello everybody. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, I'm going to be doing a practical session using uh, these things, potential pack milk cartons. Um, but before I do, I thought I'd quickly show you a few images uh, to give you a, more of an idea of what I do as a practicing artist. I've, I'm a, primarily a sculptor, but I also do murals and uh, occasionally a little bit of performance. And um, I've been at it now nearly 30 years. Uh, I sort of fell into it somewhat accidentally uh, through um, working with a, an arts organization that provided studios. And as part of their remit as a charity, they provided access to the wider community and I got involved with it doing that. And then over the years, I've worked in different uh, contexts uh, as, as well as primary and secondary schools. I've worked in a prison, I've worked with uh, people referral units and the wider community, public spaces and events and so on. Uh, and often those skills that I've learned in a primary school or in a secondary school can, can come in very handy with everybody that you engage with. Okay, so I will quickly try and share my screen. And hopefully you can see my image. Can you see that now that I've put up? So this was a project uh, as an example of uh, something bringing the community together. This was uh, a big draw. Uh, you might know big draw. I'll zoom in a bit. This was big draw in Brent, 
uh, with mainly Muslim children in Brent Mosque, uh, but it was a, a mixture. And the chap on the left is a Jewish storyteller. And we, it was a storytelling project with drawing whilst they were uh, hearing stories. And we ended up with some big scroll images which were displayed in the mosque. Um, as part of, sort of local projects when I was based in Cricklewood in Northwest London, these sheep are outside the B&Q there, which was uh, part of a project really to claim public space apart from anything, although they're, they're humorous and uh, hopefully quite attractive, they were also about the, the old idea that if you grazed your sheep on common land or that common land was somewhere you could graze sheep. So this was all about sort of trying to hold the developers at bay uh, in a crafty way. Um, so they're made out of timber. And you can see I've used repeated shapes in making them, uh, which is something I use quite a lot in my practice. So, oops, when I'm working with children in schools, I'll quite often introduce techniques uh, which they might not get to do so much and use that as a way into being creative. And here it's literally, how do you bang in the nail without bending it? Let's see if I can go through the next image. Oh, I'm sorry, if this is jumping around. So my own work as a sculptor, I quite often work with uh, materials which maybe are overlooked or, or, or everyday materials that um, we tend to overlook. This is a scaffolding plank uh, cut in different at different angles and then reassembled. So it's a very simple process. It's almost like a mechanism whereby I cut the plank and then turn it and rejoin it and then cut it again and turn it and rejoin it. And this was version five and it turned out that this one could stand up on its own so I don't always know what's going to happen uh, and that's part of the pleasure of it. This is a playground in northwest London um, off Portobello Road that was designed based on the Tangram puzzle. There were several elements in it uh, some of which were designed by pupils using the Tangram and this uh, climbing frame, if you're familiar with the tangram, you might see there's a square and different size triangles. And that um, is laid into this two dimensional pattern, which uses the same shape. So quite often I'll take a, a given thing, um, such as the tangram or the scaffold plank, and then play with it and see where I can, where I can get by doing that. Whoops. Uh, here's another mechanism that I came up with. This is using uh, foam pipe insulation, which are these foam tubes, uh, easy to cut. And basically, if you, if you slice them and then bend them and then wrap tape around them, you can hold them into curves. It's interesting in the context of what we're talking about now that I, at that time, I was using quite a lot of this tape, PVC tape, and I've now stopped buying it. And the, the tape supply that I had at that time, I'm gradually working my way through, having bought some in bulk. And I'm now ending up with projects where I'm using up my last bits of tape and I'm beginning to research alternatives. However, uh, having said that, I think that Part of our role is to understand the materials and not just uh, create taboos around them. So plastic is an incredible material and we'll talk about it in a bit more in a minute. So you're getting some strange, oops, sorry. There's my, oh dear, forgive me. Here we go. That uh, was my studio. I fairly recently moved, but that was my studio. And uh, just gives you a sense of what I do. That was at the same time I was doing the scaffold planks where I cut and rearranged and um, seeing what happens. I think you can see some of the sheep in the background out of the door. Uh, 
hopefully you can see here we go so as i mentioned working with in schools are quite often introduce tools and processes uh, which mm -hmm. they may not be familiar with this is driving screws in and drilling holes uh, if they're shown how to do it properly uh, and with access to the tools and a bit of supervision, they can do quite a lot. And this is making a, a Spanish galleon out of uh, an old wooden Venetian blind that I pulled out for skip a few days before the workshop. So I also teach at uh, Roehampton at um, the Froebel College, which is a uh, teach training course and these are art specialists I teach there once or twice a year have been doing quite a while and I try and share some of my um, tips and tricks that I've picked up over the years and to imagine what it's like to be an art teacher in a classroom I'm not an art teacher I'm an artist and I work in schools and I know that I'm in a very privileged position going into schools and being able to uh, arrive and have a certain amount of freedom um, and then leave so hopefully i can offer you something but um you're the ones that are doing the good work so keep it up i don't know why i keep zooming in okay so uh this is using paint this is obviously a, this is a community project these are cows that were cut out of plywood so i had some images of cows um they were to go outside an old farm building using up some old paints and hopefully you'll be able to see oh no we're jumping around this was a project in a uh, working with a primary school again for Wembley uh when there was a lot of regeneration going on in Wembley and this was done by uh getting the pupils and staff to stand in sand and then taking plaster casts off the sand. It's quite a good example of how something that seems like a very simple uh, process that you know you don't think is going to produce a great deal actually ended up being quite moving in that some of the children's shoes were quite worn and others were not. Generally, most of the shoes are all different and you wonder what we're doing why you know that we express our culture in these strange ways that we're not necessarily conscious of and it also had this thing this idea of the marks we make um and uh looking back in time and sort of having an archaeology of our current time oops this was a very nice project in uh on a housing estate where there was a lot of redevelopment going on I was offered the canteen building, which is the porter cabin behind, to run some summer workshops. And uh, it was very successful. It became a nice drop in session where, in the end, the uh, people who came began to lead the sessions, and I was literally there to facilitate. So you can see there's a lot of weaving and uh, binding and that was led by some of the girls who had it in their their repertoire having learnt it from their grandparents sorry about this so this is carving soft concrete blocks um, skills which we don't all get to do uh, but actually we're all quite capable of doing here are the cows you remember those painted cows very simple idea they're actually flat they're boxes and they were again about trying to protect these old buildings in the background from being demolished because they were uh, an old farm in cricklewood where there's also a lot of regen going on and there's now quite a nice little cafe around the corner that's the outcome or part of the outcome of the tape piece collage i use a lot of collage um, as a way into making images and breaking through 
Uh, I tend not to do much drawing. I tend to favor scissors and glue sticks. I'm sorry about this. I don't know why it does that. Um, I'll flick through. There's that finished thing. Okay, let's see if I can. This was in a Muslim school, uh, thinking about gardens and nature and plants. That was a one day session um, and it was installed in the library. So often very nice to think about the location for a piece uh, and let that feed into how it ends up. Again, you can see a bit of a mixture of materials. There's bamboo, pipe insulation, cardboard, and um, some various colors of paint inspired by Rousseau, the uh, jungle paintings. Uh, this is one of my very first projects, cast concrete. The children had worked with wooden blocks and it was inspired partly in response to the fireplace in the background. Uh, I believe it's still there. This was quite a long time ago and I don't know whether the health and safety would have allowed, would allow it now, but um, managed to get away with it. At the time I was very interested in um, the Soma cube and uh, the idea of fractals and things breaking down, uh, scaling up and having self-similarity. And that is something that recurs throughout my work. So this is stainless steel. Uh, they're all the same shape, but repeated at different scales. And with this, there is a ratio, the golden ratio, the Fibonacci series that connects one to the other, which basically means that uh, the two above are the same length when joined together as the one below. So it's it's just the it's the golden mean. Sounds terribly complicated, but once you actually apply it physically, you can see that uh, it's it's actually real uh, in terms of the effect. Right. Sorry, I might be time for me to stop sharing my screen. Sorry about the. the shabby slideshow. <laughs> anyway, hopefully that gives you a taste of what I do. Um, but those are all the sort of finished products. And uh, partly I would like to share the process with you now. So I, as I mentioned, um, have been exploring, basically during lockdown, I started collecting the cartons and various other bits of uh, waste that we produce every day, I just became very conscious of how much was piling up and that when we start uh, even just paying attention to our own space, uh, there's so much of it. So with that in mind, I was keen to begin to try and experiment with how to use these. I will do a little bit of more share, screen sharing, hope a little bit more organized this time to show you what I've done in the past using these. And then I want to build on that to do a quick workshop with you. Um, right, let's try a different screen share. Okay. Speak, talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> okay, sorry. Uh, here we go. Right. So hopefully, can you see something on my on your screens? I uh, yes, we are uh, yes. Wonderful image, Alistair. Thank you. Great. Great. Thank you. That's good. So I'll go full screen. Okay. So th this is, um, as you can see, it's a sort of skeleton fish. Some of you might have seen. I did a uh, previous live talk for. NSEAD on this process. I believe it's out there. Uh, also on my website, there is some more information about a project I did in a primary school. So this was flattening out one of these cartons I've just shown you and using the spout as the eye. So this, the given the eye, 
the, the fish followed. So what's quite curious about them is that the other side uh, has all the colorful uh, marketing blurb, which once you start breaking into it and take it away from its uh, legibility, become something else. So they're silver on one side, or the long life cartons, which are aluminium lined, are silver on one side and colored on the other. This is working with adults and looking at reference images. And the idea was to think about extinction in the oceans. So they're partly skeletal. That's the same one different side. So quite a lot of dexterity in cutting. And this is in a primary school. So this is working with primary school kids, each getting a carton. They brought their own cartons along. Uh, their parents collected them. They donated them. Everybody ended up having one. And uh, the same mechanism where the eye is the spout and the idea of the bones and the ribs and the fins. Those are details. You can see we've marked up the foil interior, having flattened out and opened the carton. And just by simple snipping, all pretty straight cuts on that one. Um, but part of what makes them interesting is that it breaks into the interior space. So there are ribs, if they look at those chevrons on the inside, and the difference between the top chevrons and the bottom chevrons, you begin to get really interesting patterns. And in some ways, I think I prefer these uh, more simplified ones that were done by the young children. So if you look on my website, uh, you'll see what I ended up doing with those fish. Um, but I was thinking about today's session and thought about, well, we don't want to just do them again. I've done them already. So I wanted to do something more three-dimensional, try and use the fact that these cartons are volumes and that's how they work. I'm going to change my input so that you can see my desktop. How are we doing for time? I think, Alistair, we've got, an, we've got another um, 10 minutes, about 10, 10 minutes. minutes. Yeah. OK, that sounds good. I'm just going to set my clock. There we go. 10 minutes. Right. So here's one of these cartons. So in terms of teaching and thinking about sustainability in the classroom, even just taking one of these objects, one of these and take, saving it from the rubbish or saving it from the recycling and beginning to look at it as something to work with is, is a positive act, changing your mind that actually maybe there's still life in this thing. So what is it? It's actually a mixture of materials. It's smooth and shiny on the outside. So it's plastic on the outside. There's cardboard, which gives it its rigidity. And then on the inside, I got one that's open. And the inside, it's like this. These are the long life ones. So they've got aluminium in as well. And then another coat of plastic. So these are composite materials. They're a sandwich of materials. And that in itself makes them difficult to recycle because once you've smushed all those materials together, it's quite difficult to separate them out. So even though they say they're recyclable, it's actually quite difficult to find somewhere that does recycle them. However, you compare them with a tin can or a glass bottle, they're very light, so you use less energy to transport them. They probably take less energy to make, and you can make things with them. All right, so. I'm flattening this out. I've taken the cap off. I've given it a rinse. Fingers crossed it's not too grubby in there. And so the, the fish ones that I did, I cut the top and tail off, opened it out, flattened it out, and worked with it as a flat piece. For this session, I'm interested in trying to keep some of this structure that is built into it. So the way that it's folded, is actually to me really interesting. There's a whole science of folding and creating these solid shapes. 
So even though I'm going to flatten it to cut it, I'm actually then going to try and pop it back into 3D and think about how to keep it three-dimensional. So there are different ways of approaching it. If I was doing it with a class, I'd probably say everybody chop it in half or everybody cut it at a curve. You could mark it up with a pen. I could mark it up with a pen. I'm going to cut a curve here and I'm going to cut, a, cut it in half there. Can you see that? Hopefully you can. So let's cut it in half first. I'm using school scissors. I thought, don't cheat, don't use my big scissors. Do you find that, does that really, does that really inhibit, um, Alistair, the, the tools that you have access to? Well, I'm trying to imagine a, a school, this is happening in a school, so there's no point in me having my nice, powerful cutters when everybody else is going to be struggling with these things, which are pretty good if they're looked after. But yeah. yes, obviously, tools are an issue. Mm -hmm. Then I'm going to cut this curve. So even just cutting skills are something that we're beginning to now make use of. Not everybody is, is practiced in using scissors as they used to be. So as I said, I'm keen to try and keep some of the volume. So I've now got a couple of pieces. What's quite interesting too, is that now that we've broken into it, you can see inside. And with this piece, we might be able to turn it inside out. So Alistair, are you working quite intuitively then? Is that, is that is that what's happening well, here? You have an idea I've, about what you're wanting to achieve? I've got an idea. So that's a very good point. I have done some preparation, but to be honest, I've only prepared as far as thinking that I want it to keep want to keep some of this three dimensional quality. And uh, mm -hmm. I'm going to you keep using this as the eye. So yeah. in terms of uh, thinking about it as a session, you need those sort of waypoints, I think, don't you, where you say, okay, we're going to make something, this is going to be the eye. It might end up not being the eye, but if you think of it as an eye, mm. then we're off to a start and we can see, I'm just trying to get my camera right here. So if we think this is the eye, then this becomes the head. Yeah. So, so then in just playing with the material, this is something you know we don't necessarily do. It's an incredible material thing. It's metal and plastic and card. So mm. let's just let's just muck around with it and see what it's made of. Now that we've cut it, we're also beginning to sort of access it. We're no longer in the way they want us to. Here you are. We can begin to see what it's actually made of. So there's the cardboard. I don't know if my camera is able to show you that. And I'm sure if I worked on it, I could get the aluminium to show as well. So even just doing that, you begin to see something happening. So let's go back to this idea of the three-dimensional shape. So if it's a, a head of some sort, I want to maybe keep this part of it as it was originally designed. So that's going to be kept as a folded box to maintain so this part here, I'm keeping it as the, the box. I'm using it as it was made. And now I'm beginning to squash and play with the other part of it. So I'm beginning to look at it and think, okay, so is this, is this the beak? Is this a mouth here? And rather than thinking about it and saying, mm, is this the mouth? It, just do it. Let's just see what happens. It's something that you've plucked out of your rubbish. So that gives you a certain freedom. You don't have to be precious with it. So now we can begin to look at it and think, oh, hello, this is looking like something. Right. So it's quite fishy again already. And maybe there's a way using, this is the bottom part. It's quite interesting how they do it. So they have diagonal folds and 
right angle folds. So I'm going to try to open up this mouth a bit by doing putting some folds in under here. Let's see if I can get it to work. Yeah, so I'm changing the geometry of the thing by putting, I've sort of forced it to do what I want. And as a result, can you see, I've put a zigzag fold in. Having done that, I could think, oh, I see. It's sort of a concertina effect, isn't it? It's one folds onto the other. It's like a pop-up book. Pop-up books, you always say, oh man, they're so complicated, they're so clever. But actually the trick is just to try it out and see if you can do it. So here's a head. I want the mouth to be a bit wider. So maybe if I can, maybe I'll cut a bit further. So hopefully I'm conveying to you, so imagine you're doing this in a classroom. Everybody, they, they're not working with that bit. They're not working with the other bit yet. They're just working with this bit. So we've sort of moved away from it being a carton and we're now just dealing with this different shape. So that's quite good. Like when I push that up underneath, there, that, whoop, that's slightly better, isn't it? So part of what we're teaching is that our hands and our brains are very much connected. Yeah. It's not that I've thought, ah, let's, you know, my, my eyes have said, well, my mouth's not big enough, but my hands are the ones that are manipulating the material. And I think we greatly underestimate and have forgotten how important, how sort of my hands are doing some thinking mm. in this process of handling the material. And also that the material is, is telling me things when I handle it that I can't know any other way because it's actually very strong and very resilient. There you are, that's sort of looking a bit more something. It's all well, gone, Bray. Go on. <laughs> I've just, you know, we've got about five minutes left, um, Alistair, and I was just going to say that uh, um, even with the time that we've left, we've got left that what you've produced there, I can, you know, there's a cat there, you know, there's a, almost like a personality and a character. I can see, you know, a, yes. an, an image has formed um, with, with what you've, what you've manipulated. Um, it, it has, hasn't it? And whether I'm projecting that onto it or whether it's giving it to me, I've got a stapler here somewhere and I, not everybody's gonna have a stapler, I know, but you might have a glue gun, you might have some sticky tape. I'm gonna staple that. So having made a bit of a discovery, I'm now gonna try and fix it. Yeah, that's quite nice. So what's quite nice is it's still got a bit of volume. Yeah. There it is, head on. Yeah. I've moved to the southwest, just at the where the, everybody's eating loads of fish and chips, just at the time, <laughs> having watched a film on Netflix about the oceans and the state of the fish in the oceans, and having to say to myself, we shouldn't really be eating fish. You think about it, how often do we eat wild animals? The fish are generally wild animals. Anyway, so look, I'm now thinking about the rest of the body maybe. Trying to keep some volume again. I've got this piece. See, that could have been the jaw, couldn't it? Look, that could yes, be the absolutely. jaw. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Okay. So sometimes it's worth just making a few snips. And inverting things. So you push mm -hmm. one in. Mm. I think also, Alistair, what I'm finding yeah. to have, um, uh, quite interesting is that your your use of words and vocabulary which I think you know real, adds a real richness to you know what we're doing in the classroom with our students but you know through the language and and the conversation that you're 
that you're having with us now, coming back to that question of how can art teachers make their art rooms more sustainable, um, just sharing in, in our experiences of the environment and the world and what we have access to, what we're using yes. and, and how that impacts. Um, and those conversations can happen and evolve as we, as we partake of these practical activities. I think you're right. And I think that actually when you're working with your hands, your brain is freed up in a different way. I have found that when everybody's working on something, particularly if it's relatively unchallenging, say, you know, something like you know, cutting out some shapes, weaving, plaiting, just sort of fairly, you know, or even just sort of manipulating this material without worrying that mm -hmm. actually we're, we're able to have conversations and be able to have a sort of flow of thought that maybe, you know, is partly enabled by making. If you think about it, we evolved as making creatures. That, that is our great distinguishing feature. See, I'm now, my hands are beginning to do this as I'm talking to you. Yeah. And it's, I'm sort of getting feedback saying, look, oh, actually, look, you know, this stuff's quite nice when you roll it up. And <laughs> of course, the children or your students, are they going to be off doing different things? Oh, yes. Yes. They often, Definitely they often surprise now. us, don't they, with, um, with doing things that we hadn't really considered ourselves because they perhaps are, are less inhibited. Yes, um, absolutely. So, look, I'm running out of time. So, I'm going to quit. Here's some I played with earlier. So there's another one. Okay. So I started thinking, okay, you know, similar sort of idea. With this, I've put, I've got the one eye on one side, and then it doesn't necessarily have to be a round eye. And I've split off the material and I've created a, a bit of a throat. So if if there's some sort of idea, which is purely this is the eye. And we're going to use touch pack, then you can end up with maybe something like that. This one I made earlier. So this wow. is a slightly different carton. Wow. And with this, it ended up, I started thinking, oh gosh, this is, you know, like a sort of headdress, yeah. it's a coat yeah. or something. Yeah. One quick yeah. thing I'll say before we go is in in approaching this it, part of the trick is to break into it so one of the things i did in making this if you look at it is i came up i thought okay let's just no oh, this pen's not very good it was the other pen, this other pen the idea that we should use all the material if possible so in order to use all the material you need interlocking shapes nature is very efficient a beehive is the bees uh, honeycomb is as it is because it's about efficiency of materials not because they want it to look pretty <laughs> so even just something like that mm. if you can see mm. and i could cut it all i'm going to cheat and use my big scissors <laughs> I hope this is of use to people. What I'm trying to communicate, I suppose, is allow room for experimentation, yeah. provide a few pointers. Yeah. Uh, the materials themselves, of course, are a pointer, as we were saying. So. Wow, yes, fabulous, fabulous, fabulous. That was just so very simplistic in many ways, but the outcome is is really quite, you know, wow. Um, and this thing of how they make three dimensional shapes out of 2D shapes, just quickly, if I want to make a corner there, one snip, and then you fold them back on each other. Right, right. Yeah, and you can sort of reverse it, but that's making a square corner. You could make it softer, so I could staple that. Oh, that's fantastic, Alistair. Thank you. Are we out of time? 
I think we are. I think we are, yes. sadly, because we're just getting into it now. Doesn't it fly by? <laughs> I know. At least yeah. you can carry on making them. Maybe, you know, on your screen. Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, well, that's you an idea. To. I could do. No pressure. No, I mustn't distract you <laughs> from you, Ella. Well, it's anyway. a small window, right? Look. Yeah. Mind you, you, actually, while the presentation goes, yeah. These... Yeah. Basically, this could be anything. This could be a milk carton. Yeah. Part of it is just saying, what is this stuff? Yeah. And, and having conversations about what it is and just mm -hmm. seeing what happens. It, it, there's a lot, so much talk about, oh, I'll switch back to my image. So much talk about, you know, where does creativity come from? Mm -hmm. And for me, it very much is led by doing it. So in yes. running a workshop, I will start with a process that everybody can do. Yeah. And that's when you can then begin to talk about, well, look, that's happened. You didn't think that you did that. Yes, yes. And then in having done it, you can look at it and your brain is going, oh, I did that and I could do this. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. even if, you know, you don't particularly know where you're going and you end up, you just say, OK, it's the eye is is the eye. Then. What happens is what happens, and that's part of the challenge. Mm. So setting well, up a few boundaries, some simple processes, simple tools, and trying not to uh, trying to overcome people's fear of failing, of course, is the trick. Yes. Well, you've certainly demonstrated that um, to us, Alistair. Um, thank you so much. Um, you, you've you know you, you've made that so accessible. I don't think there's anyone who's thinking or could be thinking, I can't do that. Mm -hmm. um so Good. i think that that's uh, um that's what's been so very inspiring and to achieve such really great outcomes it quite simplistically so and 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 the rich conversation i think that that one can but have i think if rather than sitting everybody down and saying right let's all talk about climate change and yes. being sustainable yes. much better to say what can we do with this gosh look it's made of plastic slimy why plastic and wonder if we could do this why would we not have a tin can and who invented the tin can and why did they invent the tin can and just sort of letting it take take you somewhere you know? yeah yeah <laughs> anyway well, over I, to you ella uh, yes very much over to ella ella we're looking forward to hearing oh. from 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 your practice what it is that you contribute to this whole notion of the possibility of turning our art, art rooms into this sort of sustainable place well, firstly, thank you. Thank you, Marlene. Thank you, Alistair. That was absolutely inspirational. Loved your cows and your sheep. Thank you will you. see I'm a bit passionate about sheep in a minute. Oh, great. Um, uh, so what I'm going to do is take you on a whistle stop tour of some of my work by sharing screen. And we'll go into presentation mode. OK um yeah i i this is my studio i think we're all looking at here and i'm sitting in my glorious studio in in london but i've been in practice for 25 years um and like alistair saying it does feel a long long you know a long time but at the same time not it's kind of as we all know creativity I kind of, I mean, it absorbs us and carries us or carries me. And so I don't think of my work really as work almost. It's, it's, I'm very, very privileged and lucky to be doing what I do. So, um, yeah, I want to give context to some of the projects that I have. I haven't worked with children as much as Alistair's um, wonderful career has, but I have had some seminal projects that, um, I will relay over this next 10, 15 minutes. And then we're going to have another little exercise with hands. And I'll be using this screen down here. But I realize I might have a little bit of jumping around to do when it comes to that to make sure that that screen is the main screen. But we'll worry about that later. So um, my career began as a textile designer. And um, that was back in the time before cameras were digital and so an image you took certainly couldn't be translated in a textile room like it can now on digital technology but i used to use my camera as my paintbrush in a way or my my viewfinder my seeing seeing the world capturing it and then bringing it back to be inspired from and 
Um, I'm now just showing you one of my first images on the back of a, my degree show. I um, went to, to work in Kenya, actually, and, and worked with a, um, a group making kangas. So I was really inspired by that in itself. But I was also blown away by simple things like these ma mangrove leaves. And so a quick whistle stop. I, I came back. I trialed it on table mats. Weirdly, because I wanted to demonstrate that digital technology was coming onto the table, so to speak, quite literally, and I test drove this idea that took off and it wasn't really part of my creative plan, but it did um, carry me and entertain me for quite some time. So I would bring my everyday into photographic form and apply it onto everyday products and that's kind of what I did for a, a good few years I licensed a lot and various but some seminal projects one was this A is for artist an alphabet book which is still available it's 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 out of print but you can still find them and it's a wonderful book if I do say so myself but mainly because I collaborated on it and what I mean by that is one thing I've found as a creative, a bit like Alistair saying with children, when you collaborate, it challenges you, it pushes you into new realms that you might not have otherwise done in an isolated environment, so to speak. So the beauty of this book, again, uh, and our fortuneness of being um, uh, commissioned by the Tate was that they had the audience and we could then create products that celebrated the book and indeed made a little income for us. Um, the beauty was we invited children to come and be an artist for the day at the Tate Modern, and we were allowed to put pictures on the wall in the turbine hall, which was fabulous. And so that was the beginning of sort of inspiring and working even more directly with, with children in that regard. I worked with the Tate on several products um, projects uh, for several years now. Um, I just want to show you a few of how I've then applied and worked with digital technology over the years. Um, this was the first ever electric car. Um, I don't know if Elon Musk was inspired whatsoever. I'm sure he was already onto his own schemes, but this is, as you can see, a midgets car. <laughs> My children were delighted. Um, it made me quite stressed because this was back in 2008. And I, I say that because it was really hard to find charging points. And now, of course, we're in a wonderful position of this shifting. Although really, we need to probably shift completely away from cars and then um, embrace more shared travel. So um, this was a really seminal project. And this is the Royal London Hospital. Um, on the back, I think of the Tate work and various projects I'd run at the Barbican where there was design your own tray events where we invited children to come and draw onto specific paper that I developed with my manufacturers um, to create artworks. They invited me to um, just pitch for, pitch for this project. And so I was um, able to come up with a host of ideas, which I then went and presented to the uh, hospital, uh, you know, a room full of doctors and nurses, but also a room full of, not full, but three children that were my best critics. And in a way they were the best at helping form and formulate this whole um, design. And my, my pitch was that when, you're in a hospital, unwell, particularly a child. In, it used to be that the, the blinds, you would be closed off from another, your neighbor or from the rest of the room. And you've got the lining, you haven't got this pretty textile that's on the other side. So the first thing I wanted to do was envelope the children in a story to kind of share um, a way of escapism in a way that there was one specific point about the pitch was uh, about the commission which they said we need it to feel like make, make people feel they're in London but they're in a safe place and so I wanted to celebrate London but I've extended and played with London Bridge so it's very fictitiously long 
and, and brought a whole load of, of um, narrative into the image. So fast tracking through this, because we've got lots more time for other things, but I, I've developed the business on, on, I think when Alistair was saying about how he looks at form and shape, I guess what I've done is um, through my photography, I've then captured it and wanted to translate it into pattern or indeed directly as imagery for, for playful placemats and what have you. But this image uh, was built over several years um, called Bikes of Hackney. And I say several years because I wasn't intentionally going out photographing bikes thinking I'm going to make a design. Quite often I'm taking pictures as I move around and, and then they collate or start telling a story to me. And so that's how this Bikes of Hackney kind of evolved. Similarly, this geo design is one of the wallpapers um, that has a real trompe l'oeil and 3D effect. So I've really enjoyed how photography can give, particularly on product, a play with imagery and a, a playful effect. So one of the things around uh, my business now uh, is centered around reuse or actually only making to order. And so um, these are examples of just playfully upholstering pieces that I found in junk shops or in the case on the right it was on the street. And I've run a lot of live projects um, with uh, some colleagues who live locally who are amazing upholsterers and um, we've worked together on a lot of projects. So here, one human's treasure is another human's gold. Um, what we're gonna do today is, is a, a project with beads that on um, the necklace I'm wearing that we're dubbing as from trash to treasure. And of course, this is inspired by many countries, uh, particularly in Africa, that are working still now, not just with paper, but bark tree and all sorts of things. And they are jewels. And so um, here, I, I wanted to highlight what the circular economy principles are that, um, because again, when we're saying, what do we, what do we mean about sustainability and how do we embrace it? And the, I guess the, the thing about thinking about what what does uh, what does that mean, and what how does it break down? And in a way, the word waste is almost something that we've we need to redesign or design out. And Alistair's just demonstrated how something that very quickly usually goes in the recycling bin and probably won't get recycled can be creatively played with and, and reinterpreted, particularly with 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 people. Um, and so, designing out waste avoiding pollution, keeping products and materials in use and regenerating natural systems, which effectively means working within as many um, green realms as we can with, with natural energy and uh, little pollution. So this was a fun project that we did where um, we tried to break a record, we didn't. We um, were at Liverpool uh, Capital of Culture, and we wanted to see if we could design a project, a product, make a product and sell it all within 24 hours. And this was during um, the opening night, the bottles were collected here on the left. And that night they were melted down on this makeshift uh, stage where we had a kiln and we had our friends, um, the glasswork projects who were gonna, um, uh, you know, the professional glass blowers, so to speak, and my friend, Nick Monroe. And the next day I got busy with school children, you see on the right, making and designing the packaging to which on the left, the glass was beginning to be blown and Nick had designed these vessels and, they, and it was all sort of on show, which was what was so fabulous in the summer in, in Liverpool. And here you see him drawing and on the right hand side, the effect was just um, a silver, um, um, what's it, you know, silver leaf, that's right, that we applied directly onto the glass as they were coming out. And then the next day, thanks to John Lewis, who I'd been working with at the time, we were able to, they sold out within 10 minutes, but we didn't make the 24 hours. So 
it didn't matter. It still demonstrated an idea of, of taking something that we're used to throwing away and playing with it. And now, of course, uh, glass is recycled, but it was to inspire people to think, well, how, how can we play with this? Obviously not in a school classroom. So um, I've worked with a great recovery. Um, the RSA has a, a wonderful resource and indeed we're probably all members of the, the great fellowship, but um, I was invited on an artist residency and it was to investigate bulky waste. Um, so the first thing we did was go to a waste site and that's another great thing as a designer, artist, sculptor, maker, you know, you go to these recycling centers and your brain just kind of goes, ah, well, you know, help, let me retrieve that, let me save that. Um, so indeed, we watched this beautiful sofa that we're now sitting on here on the right uh, get thrown away initially. And that was because the rules, and this was, I think they might have been changing, but they still currently stand that if there is no fire label, they cannot retrieve a sofa if it gets this far to the recycling centre because they can't, uh, they can't take the responsibility. And that's what's so kind of or crazy about these systems that we're allowing what transpired to be, even in the frame alone, at least 150 pounds worth of value in the shape, never mind the materials that we then retrieved. And so we took it apart during the residency. And then we actually demonstrated the whole taking apart at an event um, in at a trade show, I think it was. And it was there where a, cure, a manufacturer from up in the north of England called Chimera were kind of curious about our project because they make a lot of fabrics for upholstery. And they started asking questions and we were um, asking back and long story short we built a collaboration and thought well let's let's make a fabric with yourselves Chimera and let's use they were interested in trying to start working with recycled fabrics now this was um, probably seven or eight years ago now and I'm happy to say that that is now the norm more than anything that any textile we're really trying to look at re you know, circular thinking and life. And so um, this, this textile on the right called Survivor Fabric was born. And on the left, we made the buttons. Uh, we brought the public into, well, I say we brought them in, we went out onto the street, guerrilla style, and had this wonderful button making machine to uh, engage with the public to make these buttons. But the purpose of the buttons was also to hold, it's a, you know, the Chesterfield sofa was designed as such to hold back in the day, it would have been horsehair or straw. And that was, you know, a functional item, not, not just decorative, but it would keep the material in place. And um, so we wanted to use recycled wool, not least that it was, uh, the, the weave was made from recycled wool or a, a percentage of such, but also, um, to stuff it with, with wool. And here you see the final sofa. We decided to keep it exposed to kind of express and share the making of it. We put it on wheels. And on the right-hand side, you see it sitting at the RSA. So that is a great, I mean, again, for schools or primary schools, not so relevant, but for higher ed and, and um, secondary schools, the, this actual document that's still downloadable is really, um, interesting and inspiring. I wanted to share another project that I did at the Yorkshire Sculpture Park. Um, I was invited to celebrate 40 years of Art Without Walls, or help them celebrate, I should say, um, and create some product because that has been, as you've seen, some of my, um, the kind of how I've worked with um, galleries and things is producing products that they can then sell and um, make the money to to share the art. If you haven't been to this amazing place, go. It's so inspiring. Um, you can even, you know, drop in and, and walk around. You don't even have to go and look at the galleries, but it's, yeah, a few images to whet your appetite. 
I was able to stay there as a resident on on the site and um, that was just so incredible and it sort of helped me um, uh, develop these drawings which you'll now see so I I painted I then translated both my photography and my painting and here I wanted to share how um, after this making of product and being on the site, I thought, I, I basically thought and dreamt up another project, which was to tell the story from these sheep of how their, you know, how does this, this hair on their backs turn into beautiful things? And how do, does wool get cleaned and um, spun and then woven? And so I created a whole project called From Sheep to Seat, Fleece to Floor. And um, we can share that later, or um, it, you can find it on my website. There is a film called Exactly That, which demonstrates um, basically the whole process. But here I just whistle stop through some of the ways I had to then build up my colors that were inspired by the land, document and film the sheep being sheared, this place blew me away. I mean, they say, um, you know, if you go to a factory, you never see waste. They understand that, um, as the auctionman says, where there's muck, there's brass, you know, nothing goes to waste. And um, here, this was after the cleaning, the spinning, then I had the glorious way of seeing my designs come to life in a weaving, woven textile. Ooh, we won't do that. Sorry, we'll move on from that noise. We haven't got time to watch a lovely, uh, but just needless to say, the noise in these factories is intense and amazing. But the idea was also to just not just demonstrate weaving, but also to express how many other things can one make from wool. Um, and so I was able to make a, a carpet, again, still made in the UK, keeping it local so that we could see that materials, locality, it's still accessible. We don't have to go to China to have everything come back to us here. And this wood that makes the seat, or these two love seats, which was my intention, was um, a felled oak, naturally felled, that had been fortuitously drying for a couple of years that we were then able to, I worked with um, a, a dear friend, Julian Mayer, and he designed the chairs and, and they, so that came together with the project also. But this piece was one of my prize pieces because the top of this is solid wool. So the excess wool that was left over after spinning and weaving and making, we were able to work with a company called Solid Wool who are based in Devon um, and, invent, uh, and translate this felt into a solid surface that I then set into brass inspired by that tale of where there's muck there's brass and that's the film so just to close the loop on that story what i did do was take the dust from the scouring where nothing goes to waste and put it back to the land and planted a tree at the yorkshire sculpture park which was a lovely kind of ceremony of completing the project um, and indeed, yeah, in this, this place is in the factory, they don't even, I think they extract from the, the oil, uh, lanolin, vitamin D, all sorts of foodstuffs. So speeding through this next project, Alistair bringing up plastic, it is a precious material and it is something we need to celebrate and not have it in our oceans, which is why it's had so much press of late. And I wanted to share this project the, again, through a collaboration with another dear friend and very talented designer and communicator, Sophie Thomas. And these pieces of plastic she has been collecting over time from beaches. And so being a textile lover, I wanted um, to create a textile design from this image. And so we met up, took lots of pictures. And um, turned it into a textile design effectively and then printed it initially on a velvet that was made from a recycled 
uh, polyester. So that felt like a beautifully circular story that it's come from we're, 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 the medium is the message essentially. So we're, we're documenting and photographing plastic. We're turning that strong visual into a statement and then applying it onto a material. And then we invited school children to a live event where they could come and see, and again, another chair found on the streets of Hackney, uh, be given a new life. And then kind of the dialogue and conversations with the kids was, was what was so inspiring there because they were able to join in a little bit with the button making, ask questions, and, and watch as this chair started to take shape and form. And we even, again, with this time, we turned all the buttons applied with plastic. And there you have it. We decided to leave the, the open back so that we could really celebrate uh, the making of it. And that's on the Thames, which actually I'm happy to say is very little plastic there. It's all oyster shells, which was the waste of times gone by. And here you see it as a repeat textile. So this, then I developed the design with Sophie and we created a whole collection for Waste Age, which is um, where, uh, not just where Marlene and I have known each other for many years, but um, it was a wonderful connection of bumping into each other here. And, uh, and uh, as I say, we've been working anyway, but this whole just the fortuitousness of, of meeting at, at this show, um, and kind of the, the brilliance of the show. And if no one, if you didn't go, there is a fantastic book that's still available um, because there was loads of inspiring content in that to, to not necessarily read out with your, with your school children, but to at least engage with and understand to help tell stories when one is creating and making. A um, couple of more, um, stories i know i've got very little time left thank you for sharing diane um i wanted to share something that i did with a saturday club um this was a peace flag and this was done in like four hours so it was a real intense session where i i turned up with lots of scraps of my textiles two bits of color blue and yellow because i wanted to make a peace flag for ukraine but the rest was up to them and within four hours, um, they were, uh, we, we had printed, we had some wood blocks so that they could print their sketches and ideas that they'd come up with. Some made doves, some made all sorts of things. And then we culminated it into one, one whole piece. And that was shared and shown at um, the recent fair, uh, recent show at the Somerset House earlier this summer. Um, this was another project I recently worked on again with school children it would take time, but you could do it over a series of sessions where you're um, paper mache, you're applying it to the to a balloon and letting it set over time. And then um, this, as you can see, is actually from your hole punch. So this is meticulous work here, but all sorts of applications could be applied to um, to a bowl as such, whether it's wallpaper or anything. And it does, it does make a rather lovely vessel. Another project um, working with newspaper. Uh, this is the centerfolds of guardians. I've worked with children where we, through a series of origami folds, make a very simple bag. So Today, in our last 10 minutes, I want to um, engage with you guys in making some beads. And so firstly, I'm going to stop sharing here. And then I'm going to have to just do some jiggery pokery. So bear with me, please, on how I share screen here. Sorry, chaps. I just realized that this was the bit that I hadn't practiced. So, how do we share screen? Here we are. Screen broadcast, start broadcast. Thank you for that entertainment, um, Alistair. Um, it's fantastic to see your fish. Oh no. Oh, well, that's clever. So, can you still hear me? Uh, your screen yes, share. Absolutely. We can hear yeah. you. 
Yeah. You can hear me, but we can't see it yet. So I'm sorry, chaps. Wait one second. That's what I want to do. Screen broadcasting. Okay. <laughs> this is so typical, chaps. As soon as we go to live, it's not. You can see me, I know, but when I go like that, it's not big enough, and I don't know how to then share the screen. You want camera and not screen sharing for this one? Uh, it's all working, but it's just I need to make it bigger. Do you know what I, I mean? I can see you through your phone camera. Well, maybe is that is that maybe if I stop, I know what I do. If I stop sharing, maybe you maybe you've reversed the camera. Is it doing um, selfie camera? Yeah, well, that is. But if we go like that, do you see how it's pointing um, upwards? Oh, oh yeah. Thank you. <laughs> it's how to make it the main image on what you're looking at. Um, share content. I'm doing I that. I can do that, Ella. I can spotlight it. I think. You oh, just brilliant! Okay, that's so fantastic. So sorry, to people. Don't okay. worry. <laughs> yeah. Good. Now, we're, now we're seeing you. That's good. Yeah, we're yeah. on. Oh, brilliant! Yes. Okay. Sci-fi. Thank you. I just suddenly got unnecessarily worried, didn't I? Thank okay. You. Brilliant. Thank you, Diane. So, what we're going to do. And in a way, this is now time, perhaps, but if we are running out of time, um, I'll, I'll give a quick demonstration. I've drawn some templates here. I can easily send circulate a template, but I've hand drawn them specifically so that you can hand draw one as we work together. So I'm gonna do one now. And I've got um, some of my wallpaper scraps. So this is something that I, do as a trash to treasure workshop um, and we're going to draw a shape and keep it simple for the first one you will need your print stick or glue you will need some uh, cocktail sticks essentially and you will need some blue tack or in this case white tack um, to hold your beads once you make them so let's start let's move those off so let's start by choosing a shape and i think i'm going to go with a simple triangle to start with um so with my hand i am just guiding my line so that I, then i know what to cut from and unlike alistair i do not have school children's scissors um but any paper this can be done with colored paper newspaper wrapping paper um or wallpaper scraps and in fact um another colleague of mine on this trash to treasure has has used um what's it called uh, a wallpaper that has a topography a kind of um 3d effect to it and when you use that they, huh was flocked. it was flocked. it flocked? no it wasn't flocked yeah. it was actually uh, was it corrugated ella was it kind of corrugated know. paper yeah it was oh, and a glitter paper yes that's it and a glitter thank yeah. you three points yeah. thank you <laughs> so here i am covering the glue and you need to keep your bottom piece uh, free so that you can roll your um, cocktail stick. Okay, so we have this here. And then very carefully, you're going to start at the edge. You could go the reverse way, but we're going to go thick to thin. You roll it round. The cocktail stick is to ensure that you've got a nice hole for you to thread. Okay, so you can make it as as wide or as thin as you like, but the thinner it is, the harder it is to thread. Bear that in mind. And then we are just slowly rolling up. Now, I was saying with Marlene once before that there's something, and actually what Alistair was saying too, there's something very mindful about these sort of mm. things that you can, 
um, be making and talking and sharing ideas or, or discussing yeah. not just ideas but discussing the issues of what does sustainability mean and or, or how do we at home keep materials in use and if not they're going to the recycling um, and where do they then go but we like to think they're getting recycled <laughs> not incinerated if i'm honest mm -hmm. i think actually needs more people pressure to ensure that, that it's not just people pressure actually it's it's money but so there we have one bead now one thing to note is it you do need to leave them sorry there for quite some time to really harden and some people like to coat in glue again to give it a real seal that gives it a glisten personally i quite like the matte finish but um that's all down to choice the beauty of choice so i'm going to make a different shape now um again a bit like uh, well, as Alistair was demonstrating the, uh, you know, in, in nature by affiliate, nothing goes to waste. And, you know, I've got these two shapes. So let's just use what the negatives are of what I've cut out first. So I'm going to do that one. And then we'll do that one. And so in during, yeah, if you were to do this as a school project, um, We've talked about collective bead kind of chains and making. I recently, um, I've got a dear friend who's on he on holiday in your uh, wonderful um, uh, Jamaica. Oh, lovely, Marlene. Yeah, and Fantastic. I I say this because she just posted this fantastic story of. A gentleman who has been collecting lighters, discarded lighters as soon as they mm -hmm. run out, yeah. and chopping them, chopping them up mm -hmm. into beads wow. and then threading them individually and making curtains for fly, mm -hmm. you know, fly door door curtains. I mean, yeah. just exquisite. Yeah. And yeah. the sort of mindful, glorious, beautiful work that will probably take him forever but such a genius way of working with a material that we otherwise discard and it's as Alistair said this idea of plastic being a problem it's only a problem if it ends up in the wrong place mm. and um yeah the sad thing is actually that most of the water pollution of rubbish is not just the general public it's actually you know ships discarding the stuff or it's not just uh yeah, the malaise of the public, but I guess the whole thing of the clean up ocean um, projects and inspiring people to do the clean up then makes you think all the more. And I'd like to think a bit like in our lifetime, it used to be glass uh, that we collect from the beach. And now it's plastic and hopefully within the next generation, it just won't be. It will just be shells and stones that they're still collecting from the beach. That would be what would be glorious, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that because it's been being brought more and more to our consciousness um, and we can look to creative ways in which we can solve um, this issue that um, where we're, you know, equally, you know, that we're, we're gaining, but we're gaining in a different way. We're gaining in a way that um, helps our, our, our well-being. Um, uh, so I think it's so tremendously important to embed creativity into a child's life so that, that making and working with hands. And again, I'm, I'm quoting Alistair now because you've led so beautifully about how um not to necessarily have outcomes and know where it's going to go but just to mm. play mm. and to, to have that curiosity mm. and um be open to mistakes mm. uh, because actually we all have to you know that's a big big lesson in in that and well actually the beauty of mistakes is not just a mistake it's like beauty in all of these things 
indeed indeed and the learning that comes from yeah it. yeah yeah now i'm wondering why, whether there's anybody has any questions now for for ella or for alistair if you want to um you know pop them in the q a and we'll try and get through a couple of them before the end of the session so please do feel free uh, if you've got anything that you perhaps want to hear a little bit more about or you, you would like to um raise And maybe Alistair can show us again some of his what, what, what you've been up to because I can see that you're beavering away there, Alistair. <laughs> yeah, I want to see. I want to say actually, Alistair, that I saw a bird before it, when you first started doing it, and and then it made me reflect on the fishes and the birds and how yeah. uh, you know there's quite a, a beautiful synergy there of some mm. you know land and sea, mm. sky and land, sea I should say, not land. <laughs> <laughs> Our birds do sit on the land, but yes. Yeah. Yeah. I can't stop sharing, so that will have to be Diane. If we want to see where you're at, Alistair, that will be lovely. Yeah. I'm going to carry on here. I'll try and find how to change my camera. Oh, I'll just show you. I'm, I'm finding it really just therapeutic watching um, you work, Ella. And, and the same with you, Alistair, when you were doing what you were... Uh, you know, when it's, you were coming out and just seeing the, you know, the inside of the um, carton yeah. was, was amazing because, you know, if I wanted that silver colour, um, I would set about painting, having to paint it. That mm. colour is fabulous. Yeah. Have you just it's done cool. that whilst we've been chatting? That's, done that. That's the head that I did. Remember, we made a head and see it's the same. That's the head that we did it's two cartons but basically i started peeling the peeling the thing apart so you can see bits of it a card these are the wiggly shapes that i cut out oh like so i was like finishing fails. i love it yeah and then just by plaiting um what's it called concertina folding i mean the yeah. light's quite good on it isn't it yes, i it think is. what's lovely as well is the mixture of the out outside inside as yes well. it's a real mm. it gives it even more dynamic dynamism in a way that's, beautiful. that's right um and the 3d-ness so the trying to keep, one, keep a bit of volume that's right yeah, the volume's eight. yeah. yes it's I, amazing isn't it? i just imagine that it's a bit like you know when we talk about the trash to treasure kind of aspect of it because you have certainly turned you know that item into a complete treasure i can imagine that that any child who makes any or anyone who makes anything yeah. like that would most definitely you know want to take it away with them or want to be sure that they yeah, that, yeah. They, yeah. They it. um and, and what a wonderful school display that would make with you know that's right you know in, especially in a cross-curricular sense where you are then um exploring and discussing you know all the various aspects you know of the materials um that, um, that you're using. Well, that's right. And of course, actually looking at nature too, because, you know, even just looking at uh, the different shapes of fins and the different shapes of fish and really, uh, you know, not just going, oh, here's another one, here's another one, but saying, mm -hmm. you know, how is the jaw different on this one? And, mm -hmm. you know, there's so many people who've spent their lives studying it and we, I think that it's very important to teach, you know, the complexity and the diversity and that that is what we're endangering. It isn't, fish is not just one thing, all the tiny little ones that have their own character. And so when the students are making their own ones, they might, you know, have a, do a few little ones or one big one or... And then when they see that each of them are different and that in nature, you know, there's this great range, something hopefully begins to click, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's beautiful. Yeah. Alistair and um, Ella, I've, I've got a, um, a question here from Ruth. Um, Ruth has said, I found quite a lot of my students can hold an aversion to wanting to use recycled materials. 
Yes. Um, they, yeah. There aren't really Ooh, good. That's or, a really good question. They're getting dirty or you know, something like that. Yeah. Um, apart from just being amazing, amazingly creative with the outcomes and approaches, have you found anything else helps remove this taboo? Talking. <laughs> because it is it's a really tricky one but how can we change a taboo without just demonstrating a that it you know it's cleaned out and 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 actually if they've brought it in themselves then they've known where it's come from mm -hmm. and actually that's it's a really important thing to engage with the taboo mm -hmm. that's almost got worse since covid in a, in a way mm -hmm. yeah. and that uh, it can only change or reverse back by by talking about it mm -hmm. and and i think breaking down what it is like alistair was demonstrating look it's card it's got metal it's got printed mm. printed material on it it's so interesting and 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 look what we can do with it it's it's engagement and discussion i think is the only way and i i can imagine that being quite challenging but um the only way is through i think with that I, I think that I think you're right. And um, with plastic, it can be cleaned and it can be it's its very nature is that it is resistant to the environment. Yeah. So even though it might be dirty or have mold on, yeah. uh, understanding that that mold is going to struggle to break it down is yeah. part of coming to terms with it. I'm always struck by when, a, when a, a bottle of water is, you know, you, somebody gives you a bottle of chilled water and you crack the seal and it's this miraculous, wonderful thing. You drink it and then it somehow transforms into this sort of, oh, it's now dirty. I don't want anything to do with it. But we have to sort of try and remember that miraculous quality of it. It's like a space age material and it nothing has changed when we open it. Okay, we've touched it, we've drunk it, but maybe the whole COVID experience is something we can use where you say, okay, so certain materials are more absorbent than others. So a card, piece of cardboard, it's very difficult to clean it. Mm. So hence, maybe plastic is a better thing to do. What is, you know, how can you get them clean? Why would, you know, using warm water, soapy water, we all know about washing our hands now. Um, where has it been? What has it been used for? As you say, Ella, if it's been your lips on it, what are you worried about, you know? Um, but yeah. food and the deposits of food and the transition of food from something healthy and necessary to something uh scary is something to for us to all get to grips with and loads, loads of these products are there to preserve yeah. and protect yeah, that's true. and we then it's like we move from the outside to the inside or there's some strange inversion takes place it's a very good question yeah uh, i yeah, really yeah. do think it's a very good question mm -hmm. uh stainless steel is an interesting material you know hospitals use stainless steel utensils and things and they you know have an autoclave a pressure cooker that makes them totally sterile again um and it can be infinitely recycled apparently stainless steel one of the few materials that can and that's but, the other th sorry alistair sorry oh, well i just wanted to say i i didn't mean to jump at the, that the plastic can be recycled as well it's just that single use is has become a, a word because it doesn't mean it can't be recycled. It's just there isn't a demand for that plastic. Therefore, there isn't a process in economic terms to do it. Mm -hmm. But what we should be avoiding is the single use for that reason and instead celebrating the, the, the stuff that can um, lie around and, and, and treasuring it, not trashing it. <laughs> And, yeah. and indeed uh, the systems, but sorry, I, I totally interrupted there. No, it's, I think that's, uh, I, I mean, I think that, you know, very sadly, because we're, you know, very um, comfortable with, with our discussions here now, but, uh, you know, we, we, we do need to, um, you know, consider wrapping up and maybe we can just uh, finish with the very last question, which, um, uh, which was posed by um, Michelle, 
where you've both got very different practice, um, but there's also very, there's quite a bit of common ground. It's very inspiring to see that common ground. You know, what is the most, very, very quickly, because we, we are now sort of um, slightly mm. over time, what is the most exciting aspect of working with sustainable practice? I think that it's, um, it has, there's an energy to it in that we're tapping it. It's like drinking from a water fountain. It's mm -hmm. like, I have no shortage of Tetra Pak. You know, I don't have to go and buy any. They're already piling up on me. And it also transforms your vision in that you walk down the street and see opportunities brimming out of waste bins. And then when you go around somebody's house and see, no, no, they're buying bottle in wa bottled water. <laughs> you know, that's something we should mention in talking about all this. Yeah. Why buy bottled water? Our water in the tap is drinkable. Yeah. So, you know, this whole thing of recycle, well, it, we forget the other R's, don't we? You know, mm. uh, reduce is the first mm. one, reuse, yeah. and yeah. recycling is the very last one. Yeah, that's absolutely the end of the yeah. line. Uh, and, on, yeah, I think that's really wonderful. And I would say um, the other thing about material, it keeps, what does it do? It keeps one on one's toes. I mean, this thing of plastic and the ocean, like I mentioned, I'd like to think, and in fact, I even found it with my manufacturers that the items we made, even the zip was made from ocean plastic discarded nets, but that is gonna run out. We'd like to think because the education is now there and it, it is that we even got with the zip manufacturer saying, uh, we're really low on stock. We don't know if we can supply. It's like, oh dear, but also, oh God, how brilliant, you know? And so the, the nature of, one man's treasure is another man's uh, one man's waste is another one's treasure is that it keeps you creative because you don't know what's coming next <laughs> design and and what comes yeah. into the marketplace and yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. yes well thank you both um i just one last comment from our president um uh liz mcfarlane um she thanks you both for a great and engaging session. She feels so incredibly inspired and refreshed. And Michelle is saying, thank you. She's buzzing with ideas and I couldn't agree with her more. Um, I just think that, you know, I, I know um, Ella, I had the pleasure of, of having worked with Ella and I, you know, meeting Alistair for the first time and Alistair, I can't tell you just how incredibly talented, gifted, knowledgeable, and amazing you are and i, I just oh. can't wait to have some more <laughs> have some more opportunities to have these really rich conversations mm. um there's so much to to learn and to to understand and to and to experience so thank you both for a really deeply engaging uh, <laughs> deeply engaging evening Brilliant. and uh, um uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm sure um uh, whatever i've i've just shared is is going to be um viewed in the same way by others so thank you again thank, thank you. you and well thank done you. all those yeah. teachers and keep it up and don't yeah don't be afraid you know learn from the kids and let the kids lead on it as much as yeah. you do all you need is a few uh way way markers to get them going and Indeed. then just allow it and learn learn as you go uh, and good luck with it all and Indeed. thank you for ho for hosting this and really enjoyed meeting you marlena and ella yeah, ditto. And, and ditto on to, to you, the teachers. I take my hat off because, I mean, I, I rarely work within schools, but whenever I do, I'm blown away by, A, what it takes from, you know, energetically and that you therefore are doing it day in, day out. It's amazing. And um, the most yeah, important work. Without you. Yeah. Thank you. And thanks for thank you. inviting me. Thank you both. Cheers. Okay.